Good morning. It's good to see you. So glad that you are here. We are going to finish up um, the third and last part of our series that we've been doing on the life of William Carey. Um, we do have um, some of the biographies available on William Carey. This is the one written by S. Pierce Carey, his great grandson. Um, and it is a fantastic book. Uh, in my opinion, I think this is one of the best uh, biographies I've ever read, if not the best, and one of my favorite books all the way around. Um, so we're going to finish up his life today. There's no way in three parts you could cover everything that um, he did and everything that is in this book, but uh, we're going to try to hit the high points um, and even some of the, the low points as well, um, because as you know, in, with any servant of God, um, that God makes a big impact through, they're not just faithful men, but they're also flawed men, right? There's no other type of man to work through than a faithful but flawed man. And we want to look carefully at his life in fullness as well. So let us pray, and then we'll finish up our series together. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the faithful and flawed men that you have put into our lives um, that we live next to and among, that we follow, that um, we even lead in our families. And Lord, there is no other type of believer we can be except faithful and flawed. And I pray, Lord, that you would give us much of your grace, that we might continue to grow and um, mature in our relationship with you, in our holiness of life, in our faithfulness to you, and Lord, what we are counting on is that the flaws will not um, hinder people from coming near to you and being drawn to you. But Lord, that as we strive by your grace's power, your spirit's power and presence in our lives, Lord, that somehow as we strive to be faithful, you would um, find us to be useful to you for your son's glory. And so, Father, draw near to us even now. Give us insight into this life but more importantly, give us insight into the biblical principles that flow out of this man's life that we can learn and from the ministry that he engaged in for so long. Um, and Lord, I do pray that you would raise up more men and women um, to go to the ends of the earth. There are still unreached language groups all over the world who will not, um, who do not have an opportunity to even hear the gospel in their language um, because they are so remote or they are so difficult to get to or their languages are so hard to learn. And so, Lord, I pray for courageous men and women who would, in the spirit of William Carey, want to go and leave the comforts of their home to go and pay a very high price at the ends of the earth so that one day around your throne there may be people from every tongue, tribe, nation, glorifying the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, accomplish this to your son's glory, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Just a reminder to you as we get started that this is not a biblical exposition. This is a uh, biblical exposition is what we normally do at Grace Bible Church, um, but it is, this series is an attempt to try to distill biblical lessons from the life of, as I said, a faithful and flawed servant whom God used greatly on the Great Commission at the ends of the earth in India in his day. So a, a text of scripture is not going to be unfolded for you, but what I do hope is that you'll be able to clearly sense at the end of the series that biblical principles were laid upon your heart um, that maybe God wants to do business in your heart with and in my heart. I thought maybe one last helpful thing that I could give you um, is just maybe a, a tip on how to read a biography, just for a couple of moments here at the beginning. Uh, in my estimation, you need to read a, um, a biography at least twice, um, preferably almost back to back, if you want to get the biggest profit from it. The first time you read through a biography, mark it up, highlight it, Make notes, capture in a fairly disorganized list what stands out to you. Um, what, are the, um, what is revealed to you about God in that biography? What are the expressions of faithfulness to God in the character that you're reading? 
Um, What are the life lessons that you can learn from? Just make this random list that's growing somewhere, um, either on paper or digitally or in the margins. Um, Look for the sins and the flaws and the missteps that were taken. Just underline and highlight. Don't try to organize everything the first time. Just anything that comes to your mind that jumps out, get it down somewhere. When you're done doing that, kind of browse through those little notes that you've made and see if you can start to see which ones stand out the most to you that maybe would be good in the season of life that you're in that might speak to you most, that you feel like maybe you need to grow the most in. And then maybe try to come up with just maybe a few headings, a a simple word, a simple phrase, a simple sentence. And then your second time going through, go back through and don't reread the whole thing. Just go back and look at what you marked. And now look at the quotes. Try to distill the quotes, capture the quotes that stand out the most to you, that impact you, and and make your own notes. Journal what you have got. When you do something like that, there's a hundred different ways you could do it. But when you do something like that, um, you make a biography now all of a sudden much more accessible and useful and memorable to you. You can come back to that book because you've got notes on it and you can recall things quicker, better, more efficiently, and it'll penetrate your heart more. Bottom line, whatever it is you do, you're gonna get out of a biography what you put into it effort-wise, okay? Um, So maybe that's just a little tip that will give you some even better ideas from there. We need to summarize William Carey's life. If you're joining our series for the first time, your best help is just going to go back and listen to the first two parts. We can't run through everything that we covered, obviously. But William Carey is called the father of modern missions. What you and I are so familiar with today regarding just cross-cultural missions or missions to the ends of the earth, world missions, we owe in many ways to William Carey. And of course, William Carey was just following the Great Commission in Matthew 28. Uh, When Jesus told his disciples, um, all authority in heaven and on earth is mine. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations. Uh, That's just what he did. He was convinced he needed to do that, and so he did. But the modern strategizing of actually the, the nuts and bolts of how to do that from where you live, like banding churches together to form a, like a missions agency or missionary society, um, plotting to send a pastorally qualified person, learning the language of that foreign culture of the unreached people, preaching the gospel to them, translating the scriptures into the unreached language, planting churches. That was trailblazed by William Carey and his team in India. Uh, The biographer says that Carey was probably the most productive missionary church planter and Bible translator of all time. Um, And as often as said, changed my mind. I think it's true. Um, I think it's very true. He was born in 1761 in rural England. He lived his first 32 years in England from age 24 to 32. He pastored churches that loved the word of God and they loved the God of the word, but they were also weak and they were sickly and they were influenced by bad doctrine and bad ideas. And they were nowhere near prepared to send a missionary to the ends of the earth. And so he labored for those eight years among the two different churches that he pastored and the association of 24 churches that had all kind of banded together. He labored in that group to tear down their wrong theology and their wrong thinking about missions to unreached peoples. And he built up the very launching pad among those churches that he one day would be able to step up onto and be launched from. I came across this quote yesterday. Missions succeeds when churches thrive. Carrie believed that. It's true. Missions succeeds when churches thrive. And that's why he wouldn't just leave them in their bad theology and go on his own. He would not go until the churches thrived and got it and it was there. It didn't matter to him to go to the ends of the earth on his own and have churches back home still never send anybody. This is what he was patient for. He had a church-centered missiology not a missionary-centered missiology. That's what's plaguing missions today. 
A missionary gets the idea that he should go, and so he does, and churches just have to bow to that will of that guy who thinks he should go, and so they go and they find as many churches as they can to support him, and the churches throw $25, $50 a month at him for, and and I, I guess that's just what you do for missions. No, that's not what Kerry did. He did not want to just be a guy that churches had to attach themselves to. It wasn't missionary-centered. It wasn't William Carey-centered philosophy that drove him. It was a church-centered missiology. The Great Commission belongs to local churches, not to missionaries. It belongs to churches, and he would not go until those churches were thriving. That's commendable. In 1793, he and his family sailed for five months from England to Calcutta, He spent the last 40 years of his life in India. The first five and a half years of those 40 years in the Calcutta region uh, were spent learning very difficult lessons of what it actually cost to live in that unforgiving climate and culture. The last 34 years of that 40 years, he spent in a place called Sarampore with two other primary team members. You can forget these names for now, William Ward and Joshua Marshman. There were many others that joined them along the way, and that is where Carey was exceedingly fruitful in Bible translation work in Sarampore. He and his team translated some 212,000 resources into 40 different languages. William Carey himself translated precious portions of or all of God's word into 35 different languages, just himself. Carey believed that the Bible in the language of the unreached people was the permanent missionary, the better missionary. And so he didn't make them be dependent on him. He wanted them to be dependent on the word of God. And so that's why he labored as he did so much to put the Bible into their own language so that that missionary, the word of God, could be with them forever. William Carey died in India in 1834. After 40 years of ministry there, he was 72 years old. Nobody from Great Britain, nobody from the West, nobody from outside of India lived that long in India (laughs) under those conditions. William Carey did. And he never returned once to England. He never desired to. The biographer says that Carey and the churches in rural England that sent him were all nobodies from nowhere with no influence. And it's true. It's true. But that is God's way to call to himself and use for his son's glory on the Great Commission not many wise, not many mighty, not many noble, but God chooses the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong and the base things of the world, and the despised things God has chosen, the things that are not. That's William Carey, and that's me, and that's you. We're the things that are not. And he chooses people like us to shame the things that are, so that no flesh may boast before God. They were all rural, working class, poor, barely literate churches, and what they accomplished can only be attributed to Jesus Christ, and that's the way it is. They were nobodies from nowhere with no influence. Again, the goals for my series here as we finish up, I just want to encourage this gathering of nobodies from nowhere with no influence to be faithful. Just be faithful and do not despise the lowly providence that God has put you in. It may feel like you got a pile of disadvantages against you and and you just don't. God's not at a disadvantage. That's The second lesson or the second goal that I want you to be thinking about is God is never at a disadvantage in your life in the Great Commission. Jesus Christ is the one with all authority in heaven and on earth, and he determined the times and he drew the boundary line of your living that you live in. There's no plot of soil on the face of the planet that has God at a disadvantage. No place. Do you believe that? It might not feel that way to you, but that's not what I'm asking. I'm asking if you believe that God is never at a disadvantage anywhere in the world. And he can only work through people like you and me that feel like we have a pile of disadvantages against us. I also want to ignite or maybe reignite your interest in William Carey to study his life. Um, Maybe most importantly, I want to stir up some of you 
to actually give up everything and go to the ends of the earth like William Carey did. We need more people to go. There are still people perishing. There's an estimated 3,000 language groups that still do not have the gospel in their own language, and they will perish if somebody like you does not go. And for the rest of us, we need to be stirred up to passionately support those people who do go from among us. Um, We need to uphold them, pray for them, financially support them, so that missionary church planters and Bible translators can live at the ends of the earth for God's glory. I'm going to put up the lesson categories for you. I'm not going to run through them all, but there you see them. These are the ways that we're trying to get the most out of this. Um, And you're not just telling the story of his life, but we're trying to distill them down into categories like this, lessons that we can learn. Today, we're going to focus primarily on the bottom three. Uh, The first two parts, we, we talked a lot about it looked like there were a lot of advantages and God was never at a disadvantage. So let's jump in. Where we left off last week, it was about October of 1792, and William Carey, who was 31 years old and pastoring at the time, um, they formed the Missionary Society finally within that association of about 24 rural Baptist churches in England. The pastors and the churches, they, they were all now convinced that they needed to band together. They were convinced that God actually would use their collective efforts at the ends of the earth to save the unreached through the proclamation of the gospel. And Carrie was that primary instrument that God used to create that launch pad that was now present. And he had hoped by that time in 1792 that maybe he would be sent and, and, and hopefully to Tahiti. That's where he really wanted to go. And that is when God's providence moved in a way that nobody saw coming. It just so happened that at that time, a Christian surgeon was now back in England. His name is John Thomas. He was a Brit, and he was back from Bengal in India from a five-year service there. He learned Bengali in three years and was able to preach and hold a crowd within three years of learning the language. And while there, he had been encouraged by other believers in the British government, a part of the East India company over there. He was encouraged to evangelize the people. And so now he's convinced, I want to do that. So he came back home after being there for five years in England. He is there and he heard about this new society, this missions society. So he wrote a letter to William Carey and he had hoped to establish a fund in London for his missionary efforts to go back into India. And he also hoped that perhaps he could go with a partner. Carey wrote a letter to the Missionary Society. He wrote news of another missionary, a more experienced one, one who had actually done it, a missionary, and he passed it along to that Missionary Society, and it looked like the Society had, by God's providence, their first missionary, and it wasn't William Carey. It wasn't him. The biographer says that note that Carey wrote, it clearly cost Carey something to write it. Can you imagine the thing that was your dream? And now all of a sudden you have to say, there's, there's somebody else. Carey would not be the primary missionary. Carey's desire for Tahiti would not pan out and that would not become the location But it seemed to them all, even to William Carey, that they could not pass up the partnership with John Thomas. John Thomas was uh, was 35 years old. This is January of 1793. And what a great lesson of an undisputable characteristic of a useful life. Carey was humble. We're going to come back to that at the end, too. He was a selfless servant. And as such... Um, All humble, selfless servants have really good biblical desires, really good biblical, biblically informed desires. You know, like he wanted to reach the lost in Tahiti. That's a good desire. He wanted to be the missionary to be sent there. That is a good desire. But what made him humble, where his humility manifests itself the most, is that he was able to lay down his good desires for something else. For what appeared to be a greater good. That's a, just a good lesson to learn in humility. Romans 12, 3, um, we are encouraged to not think more highly of ourselves than we ought. 
Kerry didn't think more highly of himself. He didn't go to making any demands on him being the guy. We also ought not to think more highly of our own desires than we ought, even though they may be good biblical desires. Do you have a category for that in your life? That you may actually have a biblically informed desire that is really good, and it just might not be what God wants to work through. Do you have a category for that? How do you hold to your good, biblically informed desire as a mom, as a dad, as a missionary? What happens when God doesn't want to fulfill your good desire? What happens? How do you respond? Are you humble? Are you selfless? And then just the lesson of the unmistakable pathway to the unreached. This is, this is amazing. God is sovereign in where he directed William Carey, right? We believe that. Carey was sure of his good desire of wanting to go to the ends of the earth. He was sure of where he should do that. He wanted to go to Tahiti. And what God revealed in 1793 was that God was never aiming for Tahiti with William Carey. And God had no trouble using a man with good desires burdened for a place that God was not aiming at. I'm going to say that again. God had no trouble to use a servant like that um, to send a place that that servant wasn't even thinking of. What's most important is not that you have the right geography nailed down and that you don't let go of it. That's not the most important thing. But what's important is that you are able to just hold tightly to the biblical principle behind it, taking the gospel to unreached peoples, and then letting God guide and direct you through his providence where he wants you to go. And God can and will in good time reveal that. Listen, it's God's path to the unreached. It's not my path to the unreached, and it's not your path to the unreached. It's his path. When the one with all authority in heaven and earth, when he says, go and make disciples of the nations. Listen, at that point, once you say, okay, he doesn't surrender his authority to your desires for where? If you're aiming for unreached people and you have your desire set, can you open your hand back up before the Lord and say, you're the king of the great commission. I'll go wherever you want me to be. That's a great lesson to learn. We need to spend a little bit of time on this character, John Thomas, this Christian surgeon that Kerry did indeed go um, and join and, and go back to Bengal, India with. John Thomas is the primary missionary of the society, um, and Kerry served alongside him. He played second fiddle. He would have never thought he would have been doing that, but he did. And it seemed so clear to the society that Thomas was just the right missionary to send. He came right at the right time. I mean, we just formed a society to do this. And then by God's providence, here he is. Here's the guy, somebody who's actually been there. But they knew John Thomas less than six months before they left for India. And they only knew about him. And they only knew about his five prior years in India from what John Thomas told them. And I'm not trying to insinuate that he was deceptive. But they just knew what John Thomas told them. And here are some lessons that can be learned from the missteps of the society and the missteps that William Carey took. Let's talk about on the good side. John Thomas is a, was a faithful servant of God, and he was flawed. Here's the, here's the faithful side. Thomas was a great Christian, the biographer says. A great Christian, a great missionary, a great unfortunate and a great blunderer. I guess he was accident prone. He exulted in the Savior. He delighted in his word. He preached on the ships that he served as surgeon. He strove to spend himself for both man and God. He was moved with compassion. After three years, he could hold crowds and reason with their teachers, so clearly he had an ability. He translated Mark and Matthew into Bengali in his five years that he was there. 
But those are not all of the pieces of the pie that is John Thomas. Those are some of the pieces. But there were other pieces that they didn't know. And the biographer says, on the business side of life, Thomas was a disaster. He was constantly... um, In poor financial condition. In money dealings, he was almost a fool. Thomas lived in the clouds, never treading the road of reality. He wrote letters meant in pastoral faithfulness, but were incredibly tactless and extreme. Thomas was the last man in the world to consult on budgeting. He was incapable of being financially precise or giving safe guidance. He romanticized the business facts of missions. Regarding what it would cost to get and to be sustained in India, his rosy picture had truth but was quite misleading, the biographer says. He had ungoverned impulsiveness and appalling business adventures. Carey was shocked and humiliated suddenly to discover the many debts of John Thomas. Creditors were hunting Thomas like a partridge. And that was when they were kicked off the first ship there at the port in London. All their belongings are on. They're kicked off the ship because that's when Kerry learned that Thomas had debts. It's a little late to be finding those things out. Once they had been in India, they arrived in India in November of 1793. Kerry had never known days so dark as when as early as mid-January 1794, less than three months later, being there, He finds out Thomas, the keeper of the purse, reported that their first year's income was exhausted with no more to be looked for from England until autumn. Within three months, they're out of money. And no more money is coming until the next fall. He had pitiably miscalculated their first year's expense. They found out all of those pieces of the pie on the way. And it was costly. Fast forward about five years, six years. By January of 1800, Thomas had become deeply discouraged and distanced himself from Cary in the Calcutta region. And a new team was now forming around William Cary. And for those five and a half to six years, though, leading up to 1800, God used that flawed, faithful servant to get William Carey, not to Tahiti, but to India, where he would be the most productive missionary ever known, probably. What are the lessons of undesirable missteps to learn from? One of the most difficult challenges as you take steps toward a worthy biblical goal in your parenting, in your marriage, in your ministry, in your mission to the ends of the earth, one of the most difficult challenges is to not let the urgency of the worthy goal to get polluted with hastiness. Do you understand? The challenge is to not let the urgency of the worthy goal to get polluted with hastiness. Carey and the Missionary Society rightly felt the urgency of sending a missionary to unreached people, but in their urgency, they were hasty with John Thomas. They were. It is better to arrive at that worthy goal without hastiness polluting your efforts. The urgency of the goal, it demands thorough investigation. The urgency of the goal is worthy of thorough investigation. And then just the lesson of undeniable evidence that God is never at a disadvantage. This is the great news. Even when our hastiness infiltrates our parenting, our marriages, and hastiness infiltrates our ministry and our missions, God is still never relegated to a place of disadvantage. Never. Never. 
God worked through all of that hastiness in ways that resulted in his praise. Listen, the, the first five and a half years in Calcutta in that region were, were absolutely brutal years for William Carey and his family, and, and not because of John Thomas primarily. But during those trying and refining years, Carey's adaptation to Indian culture and language, it was established. He had not yet, during those five and a half years, even discovered what ministry he would ultimately do. And he did not discover yet what he would be most uh, skilled at, what he was most capable of. And I wonder, can you imagine sending a missionary and them not finding out for about five or six years what it was they were really should be doing? Do you have a category for that? Because you should. Because you get this idea in your the mind of man plans his way, and we got a plan, and you need to go with the plan, but it's going to be the Lord who directs the steps. And what if it takes five and a half years for your missionary to finally figure it out? That's okay. Well, John Thomas is a helpful lens through which to look at the life and ministry of William Carey. Let's go backwards a little bit, and let's look at this missionary now through the lens of his, of his dear wife, in marriage to Dorothy. And it's sobering. And this whole section falls into the lesson of unimaginable dilemmas that missionaries face. When William married Dorothy, she too came from the poor working class of rural England. She could not read or write when they got married. She signed her marriage certificate with a cross. He taught her how to read and to write. She most likely never saw the ocean until the day she got on the ship to leave with William. And here are some of the events that shaped and influenced and impacted this dear soul. Their first child born to them in England died of the fever. I think they even had another child die before they ever left as well. I need to confirm that. So she knew the excruciating pain and the grief of losing a child before she ever left her home country. Listen, living and dying was hard in rural England in those days. Malaria was everywhere, even in England. When William Carey heard John Thomas come to the Mission Society and speak, this is January of 1793, Carey was mesmerized and he immediately volunteered, I'll go. William's wife, Dorothy, was then at that time about six to seven months pregnant. He had to go home to tell Dorothy. This is what the biographer says. Listen to this. That night and all the way home to Leicester, the calm, cold, dreadful voice of reason began its debate in Carrie's soul. Ground which had felt firm now trembled beneath him. How could he tell his beloved wife, Dorothy, that he had undertaken to accompany Thomas to Bengal by the beginning of April? It's January. It was out of the question for her to go with him, for just then she would be within a month of of motherhood. How could he ask her to face childbirth without him and later to follow with the children to India's far and foreign land? How could she survive amongst a people of foreign speech at nearly 40 years of age when she had only learned to write her own language since her marriage? Kerry realized he was in a serious predicament. When he got home and he told her, she was inconsolable. And William had to ask his dear friend, Andrew Fuller, to mediate between him and his wife. And for weeks, she could not be reconciled at all to him even going. She knew her husband was not physically strong. She had seen in England his long, enduring bouts of malarial fever. In her mind, he would never be able to endure India's hardships and heat. She was sure that she could never follow him and that they would therefore never meet again. That's what she was convinced of. And maybe that gives a little bit of insight into her... Um, emotional framework, just as a woman, as a person. And William would not give up the desire and the decision to go to India. So they made arrangements for Dorothy to move back into her parents' home and with her sisters, and Carrie would go on alone for now and return to her and the children within about three to four years. That was their plan. Early on in the decision, William wanted to take their oldest son, Felix, with him. He just didn't want to go alone. But Dorothy couldn't bear the idea of losing both of them. So she originally refused, but then later did change her mind, thinking that maybe it would be not a bad idea for William to go 15,000 miles on a five-month voyage, not alone. 
And so when March of 1793 arrived and they're leaving rural England to go to the port, it was at that time that they had their great anguish in separating. And he assured her that he would return to her in about three years and remind yourself that she's pregnant. She's going to give birth to another child. And perhaps actually, if he had gone without her and came back three years later, she might have persevered better on the field. So William Felix and John Thomas went to the port, and they soon discovered there would be a six-week delay. And I just want to say, welcome to missions. You should expect that. You file your paperwork, and somebody in the other country puts it in a pile, and it sits there. And they have no compulsion to do anything about it. Six-week delay. Their ship was waiting to join a convoy to sail with because if you were sailing on a British ship, um, the French didn't like you during the French Revolution, and they were fighting and shooting and sinking British ships that came around France, and so they had to wait. And so they didn't go back to rural England, but they wrote letters back and forth during that six-week period of time, and they, Dorothy had given birth to a baby boy during that time. So Dorothy, in the depths of what felt like the sure loss of her husband and her oldest son, she just gives birth to this little baby. And then there's an even more drastic delay. It was a providential delay. William, Felix, and John Thomas were actually forced off of the ship that they had put all of their belongings on because that's when William Carey discovered that John Thomas had debts that weren't paid and it was drawing undue attention to them and they were not given permission to sail. And that forced them to eventually then choose a Danish vessel because they could sail alone and not be fired upon by the French. And the delay allowed William then to go back to his home, to Dorothy, to try one more time, to try to persuade her to go with him. And so they walked all night, and they got to the house, and she had to be able to decide on on the dime that she would go. But with a newborn in her arms, three other boys under the age of nine, on a day's notice, she could not consent yet again. And so at that point, John Thomas was there, and he spoke to Dorothy, and he said, I, listen, I want you to know what it's like to be there five years without your family. I don't think you want to do that. You need to go with him. And so she was persuaded, and she decided to go. This woman was on an up and down emotional roller coaster ride, stressed by the prospect of going. The Calcutta district that they first lived in was a marshy, malarial district overridden with armed gangs. Dorothy suffered from grave, chronic dysentery. And early on, even Felix's life, their oldest son, his life hung in the balance with dysentery. It was also at that time that they had run out of money. I wouldn't, again, just what an unimaginable dilemma. Nobody plans for that. Nobody wants that. But it happens. The biographer said, the mental disorder and distress which harrowed Mrs. Carey for the next 13 years dates from this misery. Ill with dysentery, her firstborn son still sick, unable to afford even bread, and appalled at their destitution in the strange and friendless city, her brain began to give way, and her kindly nature suffered change. Who shall lay her melancholy to her charge? And who shall justly blame Carey? He could not possibly have anticipated nor conceived the conditions which induced it. Nothing was here for reviling, everything for compassion and tears. Missionaries' wives paid dearly in those early years. Carey's wife soonest and heaviest. Now, the author of any biography will only show you the subject, the way that they want you to see him. And I'm not trying to say there's any deception with that, but he was a grandson, a great grandson. And many biographies had been written of William Carey that were very harsh on Carey and what he did. And he says that he wants to show the humanity of the situation of of William Carey and what his wife went through. And he wanted to present Dorothy in a better light than what she had been presented in. And so you're going to hear him say, there's, there's nothing to judge here, but just only pity. I don't think that's unwise. Are there lessons to learn from this? Absolutely. We'll talk about that. They next moved to the next location, and Dorothy got dysentery again. Not long after this, their five-year-old son Peter got malarial fever, and he died. 
these relentless woes continually burdened fragile Dorothy even more. The biographer says, early in 1795, they've only been there maybe two years, his wife fell ill again with, dis- with serious dysentery, and then all the strain that she had lived through reacted upon her till her brain became the haunted chamber of morbid fancies and tormenting fears. She grew the opposite of all she naturally was. Those whom she most tenderly loved, she turned most against. Her spirit passed into a permanent gloom. It was the price she paid for venturing to India in those unsheltered years. None, knowing the facts, will cast stones. Sympathy is the only fair response, the biographer says. In 1807, Dorothy died. 12 years later. Her mental distress, the biographer said, had greatly worsened throughout the last five years. Her state of delirium complicated by deep misery and violence was such that the Danish authorities in Serampore begged William to put her in in an asylum. Twice she had tried to kill William. The lesson of unimaginable dilemmas that servants face was Was there more they should have investigated in Dorothy and William? No doubt. No doubt. But but these are pioneers blazing a trail. And pioneers don't know what they don't know. Would she have benefited from William going for three years first and coming back to get her? Probably. Probably. What lessons do we distill down from this? Listen, elders, family, small group members, all of us need to graciously and honestly weigh in on the missionaries' fitness for missions. There needs to not just be an assessment of biblical knowledge and theological fidelity, that has to be there. If you don't have that, don't go. There needs to be a measurement of qualified character. If you don't have that, don't go. But there also needs to be an assessment of, I don't know what else to call it, but the sturdiness of personality. If somebody you love is considering going to the field, be courageous and speak honestly and graciously to them about the perspective that you have on them, remembering that your perspective is a piece of the pie that is them. Your piece is not the pie, but you have a piece that needs to be put into the pie. And all of us need to do that with one another when we send somebody to a faraway place. Speak courageously, speak graciously, Speak honestly. Are you considering going to the mission field? Some of you are, I know. Listen, do not take offense at a thorough investigation of you. Do not despise a thorough evaluation of not just your biblical knowledge, not just your theological categories, not just your character, but are you sturdy enough in your demeanor? Are you sturdy enough in your personality, in your emotional life, to go, invite that kind of evaluation. And all of us need to remember that God, listen carefully, God does not require us to be omniscient such that we're responsible to see every potential response they'll have on the field. God does not put that on you and me. We just get to do our best and we get to just trust the Lord. Listen, Losses and setbacks happen here at home, and God doesn't require you to be omniscient and know them here, does he? And the same thing happens far away at the other side of the planet in an unreached people group. Losses and setbacks happen there, and he doesn't require you to be omniscient there. And joys and amazing accomplishments happen here at home, and they happen over there too. Pray for your missionaries on the field. They're put into dilemmas that you and I would never imagine wanting to be in. Just pray for them. Pray for those who are considering going. They need wisdom. They need maturity to think through these things. All right, I want to finish on a more 
um, positive note, perhaps. Examining some of the lessons of undisputable characteristics of a useful life. We'll look at William's life. We'll look at his teammates, uh, the sending society that sent him. Here's what the biographer said about William. This is what other people said of him as he was growing up. His hunger and thirst for knowledge set William apart. Whatever he began, he finished. Difficulties never discouraged him. As he grew, his passion for knowledge increased. From a boy, he was studious, deeply and fully bent on learning all he could and determined to never give up a particle of anything on which his mind was set till he had arrived at a clear knowledge and a sense of his subject. He was never diverted by a Allurements, nor was he driven from its search by ridicule or threats. Carey himself would say this later about himself. I love this quote. It's one of my favorites. He said, I can plod and persevere. This is my only genius. I can persevere in any definite pursuit. To this, I owe everything. That was the quality that he felt made the difference for him in a faraway place. I can plod. Can I just encourage you, bombs, keep plodding at home. Keep plodding. Husbands, keep plodding. Wives, plod with your husband another day. Okay? Persevere one more day. Small group, Small group leaders, keep plodding with one another. Elders with your sheep, keep plodding. Keep plodding with your church. We've talked a fair bit about in the prior two <clears throat> messages how the very churches he labored in were ensnared in bad theology such that they would never send a missionary to the heathen world if they stayed in that bad theology. And that was, I just want you to understand, I want to hit this one more time. That was Carrie's arena of churches. Okay, he faced that dilemma not as an outsider who was invited in to fix it, but those were his people. Those were his churches. Those were his sheep. He was one of them. Those were his people. Carrie was truly amazing. First, he was capable of seeing clearly the error of his own theological camp. That requires a degree of maturity to be able to do. He could see the error of his own theological camp. But it didn't stop there with William Carey. Second, he was able to not be corrupted by the errant theology. He, he wouldn't drink the Kool-Aid they were drinking. But maybe most importantly, thirdly, he would not abandon them. He wouldn't abandon them. But instead, he only labored to help them grow. Listen, many men can sniff out the weaknesses of their church, you know, their camp, and that's about as far as they go. And some men are able to identify that and not be corrupted by it, and Twitter proves that every day. But how many men are there who see the weaknesses and are not persuaded to buy into the weaknesses, but then stay and labor to bring that needed growth. Listen, be that woman, be that man. It's an undisputed characteristic of a useful life. I want you to see next the ability of Kerry to look into the condition of his own heart and humbly assess it. Listen to what he said. I have reason, this is in his journal, I have reason to lament over a barrenness of soul and am sometimes much discouraged for if I am so dead and stupid, how can I expect to be of any use among the heathen? Do you know when he wrote that? He wrote that on the ship on the voyage over. He said later, my soul is a jungle when it ought to be a garden. 
I can scarcely tell whether I have the grace of God or no. How shall I help India with so little godliness myself? Listen, he felt acutely the depravity, the residual depravity of his own life, didn't he? It didn't go away once he was a missionary. It doesn't go away once you're a pastor. It doesn't go away once you're a a small group leader. It doesn't go away once you get married. He also said, such another dead soul scarcely exists. In other words, no one else is as dead inwardly as me, I'm sure. My crime is spiritual stupidity. Indeed, I dread that I may dishonor the mission. Kerry knew how big of a threat he was to everything that God appointed him to. He did not see himself as the asset that his team needed, but he saw himself as the threat that they could all possibly lament. Later, upon recovering from near death due to fever in India, Kerry said, God has spared my life. I hope it is that I may serve him better. I have been but a loiterer, but a half-hearted servant who translated the Bible and portions thereof into 35 languages. If that's loitering, we're done. We're just done. Listen, can you assess yourself? I mean, this is what we labor with our kids, right? I mean, their their self-assessment is just broken. The dial is broken. And it only gets fixed by the Spirit of God. Okay, those of you with the Spirit of God, how's your dial? <laughs> how, can you, how are you assessing yourself? But what accompanied almost all of those kinds of humble, lowly assessments of himself uh, was nonetheless the commitment to never give up. He said, I would not abandon the mission for all the fellowships and the finest spheres in England. My greatest calamity would be separation from this service. May I be useful in laying the foundations of Christ's church in India. I desire no greater reward, nor can conceive higher honor. So the one who is most skeptical of himself is the one who would not give up. What a great man. One last, uh, second to last, undisputable characteristic of his humility. Later, by the time he has been there for 25 years, 30 years, missionaries are now coming from everywhere, from the colonies. They're not colonies anymore. It's the United States now at this point. They're coming from the United States. Adoniram Judson has come through. Jonathan Edwards' grandson is over there. I mean, they're, they're, everybody's coming to where Kerry is. And so uh, they would all stay for a while, and then they would go on to Burma or wherever they were going. And another missionary to Burma wrote this about Kerry when he came across him. Listen to this. He is most remarkable for his humility. He is a very superior man and appears to know nothing about it. The great man and the little child unite in him. And as far as I can see, he has attained to the happy art of ruling and overruling in connection with his team without asserting his authority or others feeling the subjection. And all of it is done without the least appearance of design on his part. Ah, oh, to be more like that in our marriages, in our parenting, in our homes, in our leadership, wherever the Lord has us. And it only seems appropriate to close with the well-known and remarkable devotion and commitment to one another that Carrie and his dear fellow pastors back in England had toward each other as Carrie left for the ends of the earth. Before Kerry left, he drew his four friends, four fellow pastors very close to himself, Andrew Fuller, John Ryland, John Sutcliffe, and Samuel Pierce. That's the great, at some point, the Pierces and the Carries kids met married, and that's where S. Pierce Carey comes from. 
He drew them together into a covenant that, as he went forth in the name of their master and in the name of their society, they should never cease till death to stand by him. And to this they pledged their faithfulness. Later, in Fuller's warm mind, that took imaginative shape. And Fuller would often thus describe it until his pictorial words of the rope-holding pledge became a fixed and consecrated tradition. This is how Fuller himself described their commitment to one another and to carry for the sake of the Great Commission. Our undertaking to India really appeared at its beginning to me somewhat like a few men who were deliberating about the importance of penetrating a deep mine which never had been explored before. We had no one to guide us. And whilst we were deliberating, Carrie, as it were, said, well, I'll go down if you'll hold the rope. But before he descended, he, as it seemed to me, took an oath from each of us at the mouth of the pit to this effect, that whilst we lived, we should never let go the rope. The biographer says, with entire fidelity, That covenant was kept in every case until broken by death. Like walls, they stood about carry, four square to all the winds that blew. He could not have been blessed with more devoted and committed comrades. He also experienced great hardship from them as well. But that's what we do to one another and with one another. We love each other really well and we stay really committed to each other and we also cause trouble for each other. And I just want to just say this, Grace Bible Church, we we have missionaries and we have servants of missionaries at the ends of the earth in Italy helping them and they are holding the rope over there and they have calluses. I just want to thank you on this side for also having calluses. Good job. Thank you for holding the rope for the Cans, for the Mitchells, for the Twombleys, for the Laymans. There's another family I'll tell you about at some point who's probably joining Madang soon in the next 12 months. There are two teams in the pipeline looking to go to do tribal church planting in the next two to three, four years. We need to hold the rope there. And and by the way, there's more, there's more rope. There's more room at the top to hold the rope. And there's more room at the bottom of the well of the, of the, of the mine to hold on and be sent. So just thank you for being faithful. Thank you for upholding your missionary so well. Thank you for persevering through this uh, life of William Carey. It's a a life worth studying. Let's let's close in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you again just for the life of William Carey. Thank you for the high price that he paid, that Dorothy paid, that Felix and Peter and others paid uh, so that their mom and dad and dad could bring the gospel to people who would perish otherwise if they did not go. Lord, we do not know how to sort out all of the unimaginable dilemmas. We cannot predict all of them that our missionaries will face, but what we do know is we must hold the rope and we must remain committed to one another. And you are worth it. You are worthy of that kind of a, of a hold for the sake of the Great Commission. Lord, I pray that you would raise up many more who would want to go, not just from this church, but from a fellowship of churches together who would be convinced that while we still have time, while you still have not yet returned, we must go and we must translate the Bible and we must plant churches. We must preach the gospel to those who will perish unless we go. Lord, we love you. Thank you for those who came to us and overcame their fears and had courage and they shared the gospel with us. Lord, may we do the same at the ends of the earth and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.